If you think about Porsche in general, you might first think about the sports cars and especially the 911. But if you think globally now in sales, Porsche is meanwhile rather an SUV brand and the Porsche Macan is their worldwide bestseller. This one is a full review of the Porsche Macan facelift with a special focus here on the entry-level engine two-liter four-cylinder. Is that still a real Porsche? And how does it compare to the Macan S, the three-liter six-cylinder that AJ has recently driven for you with the facelift? We'll clear all those questions here, a detailed portrait in exterior, interior and the driving experience on the German Autobahn here today, also with some high speed here for this very engine to really test its performance. On Autogefühl in Full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! In the front, what has the facelift changed? Well, the fog lamps went away and you have a new daytime running light here in the lower area. LED is now from standard and optional you can get adaptive LED lights. In general, of course, the Macan has this sleek Porsche design here in the front and indeed it is a Porsche SUV like a, you know, put up 911. I think design-wise you can still realize that. If the facelift is now better, or worse, that's just personal preference, but I think it definitely um, adds some more elegance to the design, I think. I think this is a very good example for a nice sleek SUV design. There's always the problem with designing SUVs because they're just higher, so they tend to look a little bit clumsier than lower cars, but I think they manage it here quite well. Just round design scheme here overall, 18 to 21 inch wheels are available those ones are the top wheels here i'll talk about later about those ones here as for the comfort suspension wise you get the base suspension then you have the pasm 50 millimeters lower suspension we have that one here today and then optional also very rare in this segment here still an air suspension the mercedes glc has that audi q5 also has that and since audi q5 the old audi q5 by the way and the porsche macan share the same platform that is also being offered. Interesting that together to the white color here today, there's the contrasting black integrated ring right here that fits very well. And also we have black frames around the windows today. I think there's a good contrast here to the white car overall. In the design, by the way, I really love those wheels, this spider style, you know, like um, 90s BBS inspired. I really like it. What about you? Coming to the rear of the vehicle, you see the biggest difference from the exterior since the facelift, and that is this light strip that goes all over the vehicle now, corresponding also to their all new models. And I think it fits the car very well and also straddles the width a little bit more. Other than that, still a very round design scheme. Those exhaust tip here, by the way, they are one piece. However, the rear exhaust is approximately that big. And then this whole outer part, of course, you know, that's not <laughs> where everything, you know, uh, the air comes out, but they made an effort to put it at least in one piece. That's always special here when you open the hood, the light stays down and then those gaps in top of the hood. Very interesting with the Macan. Today, the two liter four cylinder engine, six and a half seconds is the acceleration, 245 horsepower with the sports chrono package, of course, this 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour acceleration. Then there's also a 3 liter V6 in the Macan S with 304, 354 horsepower, 5.4 seconds acceleration figure, so about a second faster. And then there's the new downsize 2.9 liter V6 turbo with 440 horsepower in the Macan turbo.
interior right here. One design scheme is everything in Porsche is always wrapped tightly. That's very beautiful horizontal stress. Also nice build quality. You also have some decent space at the inside of the doors. This is of course a special color combination, white on the exterior, beige on the interior. In the US you see a lot of vehicles like those, also from different brands. In Europe, mm, hardly. Maybe then in the south of Europe, but in the northern parts of Europe, really people don't like that. What's your take on that? I personally have to say I just like it because it is somehow, you no, know, it's just bright and friendly and gives a little bit, you know, of like Sun California style, something like that. So <laughs> I like it. What about you? So interesting is, since the facelift, what changes do we have here? Well, it's mostly about the infotainment screen, but we'll soon take a detailed look at that from a number of perspective. So far, let's talk about the seats. They are base seats that then rather go like straight here and on the left area. Those ones here are the adaptive sport seats that have a wider shoulder area right there and also bigger bolsters in this and also in the lower part. Besides that, as for the surfaces, as a standard Macan, both also in Europe and the US, the middle parts usually come with Alcantara and the outside then leatherette. And the great thing is you get them in black, in beige like here, but also in gray. So three colors available, also with nice Alcantara. Those ones here are the optional animal skin seats, about you know, over 6,000 euros extra. You can save those and the Alcantara will also stay a little bit cooler in summer and warmer in winter times. So save the money, go for the base Alcantara seats. Steering will be here again, last shot at that. You know, you have already a lot of controls at the steering wheel, but they keep a little bit away from that as they here still use those columns here. But you might remember this old column here, this one here, it feels really weird when you shift that one, um, like, like this here, like the resistance you feel here. It's a little bit weird and doesn't really um, resonate the rest build quality at Porsche. But the newer ones, the newer turning indicators and they're all new models are now a little bit better. Welcome to this updated interior. Main element here, this new screen, 11 inch. That's the biggest news. Well, we have just a clearer view. Everything is bigger and wider and also easier to control. This one here is the GPS, for example, suit more details to that. Steering wheel right here again with just a few controls right there. The right side here, right thumb to control the very small screen on the on the right side part here. Rather classic instrument with this analog dials. Well, the right one, of course, is then the screen. For example, also with all wheel drive information or also then the GPS map if the GPS is running. And the left side, you have the volume control. Nice shifting pedals here too. You still have some hotkeys here for the infotainment screen and also the volume control here, so steering wheel and here. Then the lower console here, you know, there are a lot of buttons still. Do you like that? Do you like it separated like this one here or is it maybe too much? I like it is at the temperature control still manual. However, it's not that easy to control as you would just have a turning knob, but that one is still separated right here. When we drive, we we'll also talk about those different driving modes and this automatic gearbox here. Um, quite high this lever we see they nowadays also in the all new cars put very very small ones where you can almost shave with well <laughs> that's an insider you'll get it when you uh, watch the 911 review and there are also adaptive cup holders right there and then you have an armrest by the way shake test here pretty well attached and underneath you have two usb supplies put your smartphone and also below that some other clutter here again in detail the overdrive distribution tire pressure, the consumption in detail, for example, but also when you have the ACC, the optional one, now also equipped with the autonomous, autonomous emergency brake, if you pick that combination then for the distance settings, for example. And this is the new infotainment screen here with a nice CPU unit. You see here, pinch and zoom works pretty well. You also get somewhat like a, like a feedback with the clicks phone, either with Bluetooth or with Apple CarPlay then with the cable connection and then you can go right here. This is the integration. You can at the same time see the GPS because it has this wide screen, very interesting, but you can always go back here to this GPS here in this full view. Then you also have um, 
for example, here at the vehicle settings, you can change the light setting and so on. And also with some nice visualization. So overall, you know, pretty nice to use. And I like to have some hotkeys still, especially they can easily access the GPS again. And the sound system, by the way, is also pretty powerful. It's the optional Bose sound system we have here. Let's get inside here. And it is an SUV, mid-size SUV. And therefore you also have some you know, decent upright seating position. However, I always raise the back part of the seat a little bit higher. So this would be the lowest position. And when weight is 86 or 6 with one, still leaves plenty of headroom. If you go for the optional panoramic roof, you will have a little bit less headroom, but you see it will still also work for tall people. So I put the back part of the seat always a little bit more upright. So you, the seating position is a little bit more, more upright. You have better overview and also more long-term comfort. Those base seats, I would rather give, give those, um, you know, the first try because, not only because of the surface, but also the more open form, you know. It's of course a matter of, a matter of um, taste, but especially if you're a little bit taller in general, maybe also a little bit wider, those base seats will give you a little bit more space to move around. Those sports seats here are definitely narrower right here, although I already have those bolsters in the most open position, you can even close them a little bit more. However, if you're rather small and need this support, then this seat form might then be better. Again, steam wheel has a good size. You can adjust it here in an electric way, also in reach. Takes some while, you know, but overall does the job. There's also a heated steering wheel available. This is an option. I will also tell you more about prices very soon. Yeah, pricing is something really to discuss with this vehicle. Well, if AJ and I test the very same vehicles, always take to, into account that AJ is a little bit smaller, so that's more helpful if also you are also maybe rather his size. And if you're rather my size, then it's better for you to um, watch my review too, or maybe just compare those, because AJ was quite fine here in the rear, but I'm actually not, so the package of this vehicle is not the best. Yes, it's shorter than the Cayenne, but then again, for the length of this vehicle, it does not offer so much rear legroom. That's rather disappointing. So I do hit the seat here with my knees and I'm in the driving position. I would be driving indeed. Headroom wise, that's no problem. And I really love this beautiful Alcantara ceiling. Then there's also some USB supplies here, two USB supplies in the rear next to, if you want, additional climate zone. Isofix at the outer parts of the seats. And there's also an armrest with cup holders right there. And you can even use this one here as a ski hatch. It's always a little bit funny because you open the Macan trunk right here at the wiper. And then as for the measurements here, you have about just under a meter in length and just about a meter in width. That's totally okay. And in height right there at this cover about 50 centimeters of course a little bit less in the front area liter figures here is 500 liters like this and 1500 liters if i flip the seats here you can see also this cabin trolley can be put in a vertical way so you're actually just fine with this luggage compartment i think and if i flip those seats here we go one third two sort split but as i've shown you just earlier you can also just flip the middle part as a ski hatch that's possible and then we'll come to the maximum setup you have to go around and do it from the rear it's not possible um, like from the rear compartment not possible to do it directly from the trunk and then here we go with the maximum setup oh and then there's also a 12 volt power box right there and power outlet maybe for like a your mobile cooling box or something Blind spot monitor here, you can see it very well. One of the assistance system features. And welcome to Thomas's driving lounge here with the Porsche Macan. Today the special with the facelift, of course, and also the two liter four cylinder, as said earlier, AJ recently had the three liter six cylinder in the Macan S. So we start with some city driving right here. And then we head over to the motorway and also to a part where we can really let this car fly and see what about this performance? Is it still a Porsche performance wise? How does it feel? So how does the Macan perform here in city driving? Well, the 
one advantage is if you compare it to a Cayenne or if you decide between a Macan or a Cayenne, the Macan is just smaller so you feel you know, a little bit more eased inside the city, easier with parking spots and so on and just also when the streets are a little bit narrower. It has a great handling, so you have a direct response from the steering wheel, a very natural steering feeling. It sits very well on the road, feels pretty light and agile, and it indeed even feels a little bit smaller than it actually is. As assistance systems, you get also the adaptive cruise control, for example, it's also equipped with this very vehicle, so at the moment, you just need to set it in and keep steering and accelerating and braking is done with the car then. If you want to increase the speed and push this extra lever forward or hold it a little bit longer to go in 10 kilometer steps upward and downward. Probably miles, I make it five, five steps, or like five miles steps. Do you know that you have a Macan yourself or maybe a Cayenne with that cruise control? Then please tell me in the comments. And the interesting thing is that now with the facelift, they include the autonomous emergency brake so the so-called city emergency bag into the ACC. It's still not standard equipment. That's really a shame for such an expensive vehicle. But at least they included it in the ACC. Before that, the Macan did not have that. Pretty interesting. They were arguing that they don't want to intervene with the customer, you know? So, yeah, but I think, you know, as for safety, um, this is absolutely a good, um, good decision to have this one from stand equipment. Everyone might be not, you know, not really paying that much attention at some point for what reason whatsoever. So this is really a very important system. And having a lot of fun already driving the Macan here in the city, as it's so agile. It always, you know, when you approach the next lane change, you hear something, situations like those, you're always happy for the next lane change for some steering action. That's just a lot of fun, I really like that. And again, the size, this mid-size SUV is a really good one because mid-size SUV, you can still use it for almost everything you can get along in the city. It already has a decent comfort. It's not too big. Um, so they're actually a good compromise where you can do a lot of things with just that very one vehicle. This one here is equipped with 21 inch, the maximum wheel size. And also with the PASM, the Porsche Active Suspension Management. This was an old KN, by the way. So there's the standard suspension, then there's the optional PASM, PASM, the adaptive suspension, but it's also 50 millimeters lower. And then another option is the air suspension. Well, I would go for the air suspension, especially if I would lease the vehicle and not maybe like keep it for 15 years or so might get very expensive to repair an air suspension. You always have to keep that in mind when it's, you know, when it's broken after that, like a couple of years or something. I, I, know, I don't know how long it takes, you know, but um, we also have a lot of customer experience. We really say, you know, like there was a little really high uh, repair cost when they were repairing the air suspension and so on. So if you keep the car for 10 or 15 years, you might take it into account. However, then also the car is really expensive and if you want the best comfort, the air suspension will do best, yes. And then you might as well spend the extra money on that. So where an air suspension is available, I think usually it's also good to go for it. With BMW, it's not that necessary because their normal adaptive suspension are really that superb that you also have a lot of comfort even if you didn't pick the extra air suspension. Here, you definitely have more comfort when you have the air suspension, no doubt. And well, together with this 21-inch wheels, the suspension is indeed quite stiff. This car will still be sporty if you have it, the air suspension or if you go for the base suspension or if you go with a PASM and pick like 19-inch uh, wheels. It will still feel very sporty, just not that rough, you know. Sometimes people mistake a rough driving characteristic for not, you know, for, for, you know, for, for being sporty. So, the car's not necessarily sporty when it's just rough, you know. The suspension is actually quite nice, but you feel that the wheels are just too big for those very small stuff that you face on the road, smaller bumps and so on. So, yeah, you know, if you want it a little bit stiff and rough, yeah, <laughs> then that might be something for you. 
but again, I think you lose too much comfort with this very setup you have here. On the motorway also a very calm experience. I mean, the noise insulation is also really good, so you, I hardly need to raise my voice at all. That's pretty cool. So, also a good motorway cruiser, and again, I can set the cruise control, and everything is just fine. I will also show you the blind spot monitor when someone is overtaking us. So far, no one is coming, but that will come soon. And you will see this yellow light flashing right there. I was keeping it, um, you know, with rather low speed at the moment. The overdrive distribution is always more in the rear than in the front. At the moment, just a little bit in the front. When I really hammer the throttle, then you will see that the all-wheel drive is also transporting more torque to the front wheels. So the rear wheel bias here for the all-wheel drive is somewhat guaranteed. Consumption is just close to 9 liters on 100 kilometers. That has remained the same also for this engine. It's also a quite realistic figure. Think about this engine here in the Golf, for example, 2 liter 4 cylinder engine. We also end up with about 8. We can also drive it at 7. But this one's a little bit heavier. This one is an SUV. So something close to 9 is realistic. If you keep it slow, you can of course exceed it. That would be some 29 mpg US or 31 mpg in the UK, something in that region. Now when we're going uphill, it's of course also a little bit more. And we'll soon now get to our high speed part. Before that, someone will, will he overtake us. Come on, show our viewers. There it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So that was the blind spot monitor. Also a very important safety feature, you should definitely go for that. And yeah, sadly, Porsche makes you pay extra for almost everything. Now we'll also go to the sports mode. The sports mode will turn up the RPMs a little bit higher. Will give us a little bit more sound and also change you know, not only the shifting characteristics, also the throttle input, for example. And we'll get them now on the motorway part where we can really accelerate it out and see is this still, performance-wise, a real Porsche? So we'll let this, now we go from front of this car, 50 kilometers to whatever. Well, that's 150. So that was 50 to 150. And directly some comments to high-speed driving. Now we're about 160 and see it's not too loud here so that's still somewhat reasonable so i'm fine with that and the car also remains very stable in the sports mode also the suspension when you have the adaptive suspension or also the air suspension which is also an adaptive one then also the suspension goes a little bit stiffer to have a little bit more control over the car so it really feels very good at high speeds of course that's something what a Porsche also stands for. It's like nothing driving this car here at higher speeds. And you need to know the seating position and how everything is processed and so on. And also, for example, here, the brakes. Pretty crisp also when you hammer them. That definitely feels like a Porsche. So if you go for this base Macan with the four cylinder engine, you know, you shouldn't miss too much. You've seen the acceleration was quite decent. Yeah, with a six cylinder, it would have been a little bit more spectacular. No doubt about that. Six and a half seconds is the acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And that's just about one second in difference then if you compare it to the Macan S. So not too big of a difference. It's more a little bit of philosophy and you know, there are people who care, you know, really a lot about it, and then there are people who, are like, who don't care at all. I mentioned earlier, Chinese market, very big for the two-liter Macan here. And a lot of the customers there, they don't really care about the engine in there. They rather care about other luxury features of the vehicle, but not necessarily about the engine. And in the US, for example, it's especially very important that you still have, you know, a lot of displacement. So it really depends on the market. And I mean, me personally, I really like to drive high displacement, naturally aspirated petrol engine. And it has nothing to do with like higher or lower consumption because those small turbo engines here, they consume sometimes even more 
than those older big naturally aspirated engines. It's just on paper that they maybe um, consume less, but effectively for the customer, it's not really making sense in most cases, at least. So, you know, when you have more displacement, you get a little bit more calm, serenity or something, but here you have enough performance. So it's not really lacking power. It's just you don't have like this very sonorous sound. Maybe again, you know, I always talk about like the sovereignty of a car, it's more like the, you know, how, how much confidence it gives you. And that's sometimes with those bigger engines a little bit more, you know, you feel a little bit more relaxed, although you have, or maybe because you have more power, just from the throttle input. Then again, the, the power here is always there, you know, there's not such a big turbo lag or something, especially if you're in a sport mode, you've seen it on our acceleration, it was right there, you know, and also here when I'm doing some accelerations out of the corners. Mm, you know, especially here in this combination with a smaller engine and the dual clutch transmission, what do you, can you feel is that if you have, for example, a bigger engine and then also a converter automatic gearbox, I have the feeling that here the car shifts a little bit faster, you know. Um, always has to do with the power curve and so on. So yeah, if you are an experienced car driver and have di driven different engines, then you would notice the difference. But if you know, maybe not that well experienced with vehicles and you go into this car and leave the sound aside and who could really tell how much cylinder this car has, you know? So again, power-wise, that's nothing to miss. Yes, I think we can agree that bigger petrol engines are maybe a little bit more fun or a little bit more pleasing, that's for sure. But then again, if you think about the extra price you pay for that and what you already get with this engine, then of course you might start to think about it, you know? initially taught you something about the prices, 50k in, in, in the US, 50k dollars without VAT, then including VAT, about 60k euros in Germany, and then you can easily top this car up to about 90 when you have the high spec or the turbo. And then I was really shocked as I was reading the extra price list from this vehicle, and this vehicle here as we were driving at the moment is 80k in euros. Wow. Although it's a small engine. For example, this optional animal skin equipment here, together with those 21 inch wheels, is almost 10k. <laughs> so other people buy a car for 10,000, be it a new or a used one, and here the alloys plus the animal leather equipment on the seat cost the same. That's ridiculous. That's seriously ridiculous. So that's also what, one of my you know, biggest criticism points. This car is just too expensive. However, as we're on the driving part, I really have to say it drives astonishingly well, gives you great feeling. It can combine sportiness and luxury and is somewhat, you know, a better compromised in the Cayenne. You know, if you are in the US and you have a lot of space, big parking lots and you don't like, you know, West Coast or, or, or Central or something, then the Cayenne isn't such a disadvantage in comparison to the Macan. However, the Macan can maybe deliver a little bit more driving fun because it's way lighter and that might be an argument for you. So always have to think about pros and cons and also compare our reviews. So now when we're already at a little bit higher speed, let's, we're still in the sports mode, we can even put the suspension stiffer with a separate button ourselves, by the way, it's also possible. So sports mode again, see how the car shifts down itself. I can also do it on the shifting pedals, for example, go to the fourth or even the third gear, and then from 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour, give it another go. Oh, and that's again 150 in kilometers. Really fun to use the shifting pedals here. A lot of, you know, quality there too. And again, rather calm feeling, although at higher speeds. The ACC also works at those high speeds. It's no problem, by the way. And it's also very reliable overall. So, yes, it's a real Porsche. 
from the driving feeling, has enough power. You do feel somewhat as an experienced car rider that the two cylinders are missing somewhat. I think you can also easily live with that. But I think it only makes sense if you keep the extras, the other extras, a little bit lower that you can still achieve a realistic entry price and not a price like this very test vehicle here. So what do you think about the Porsche Macan here in driving and about this small Porsche engine question? And now to our conclusion for today with the Porsche Macan here in the recent facelift and also the 2.0-liter 4-cylinder engine. Exterior-wise, one of the sleekest SUVs in this mid-sized SUV segment, so to me still a beauty. The facelift changes, it's made of taste, maybe a little bit more elegant here with these new daytime running lights. I mean, why not, but not the biggest change. The big change is really on the interior with this new infotainment system. I think that's good, especially the CarPlay integration is a little bit better than before. And also, just have me know, the wider screen can do more things. Still a lot of buttons left there too. Great build quality also in the interior. You also get some nice Alcantara seats even just as a base trim. And you can also save some money. And that would also be my tip because, well, this engine here, yes, it's still a real Porsche performance-wise. Of course, you don't have the same, you know, one-to-one, -one, same performance as with the bigger engine. And also maybe the bigger engine gives you a little bit more confidence on the road and maybe a little bit more sound. But still, if you just ask about the performance, that's just it. My tip here again, don't go for such big wheels here or and, and or pick the air suspension also. That's, you know, a very good feature. Other than that, you really have to pay attention. The car does not get too expensive because, well, if you stick rather to the base price, then it might make sense also to keep with the base engine. But then again, if you spec a car like this and make it so expensive, you know, then it's the question if you can also top up with the next engine. But of course, I want to hear your opinion here on the Porsche Macan with a facelift and also the question two liter versus three liter and also four cylinder versus six cylinder. What do you think, guys? Thank you so much for tuning in.